can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, I'm here with Vance Morris and his site is DeliverServiceNow.com. I don't know how he got the domain, but hold on to it, Vance. And I'm going to formally introduce Vance in a second. Vance, I always like to talk about other episodes people should check out on the podcast. And since, it, you know, Vance spent uh, 10 years at Disney and he is all about the customer experience and the experience out of the mundane. Um... I had the co-founder of Pixar on the podcast, LV Ray Smith. That was an amazing, you know, he talks about kind of the early days of Pixar and Steve Jobs and all of that. It was really, you know, fascinating to hear about that. Also, since Vance is, um, you know, kind of meshes customer experience with direct response marketing. Um, I, you know, there's many uh, people I've had in direct response, Brian Kurtz, check out his episodes. I had Carlene Angley Cole. Dave D, who ran GKIC at one point, who started a chain of magic shops in a karate school, et cetera. Ron Popeil, the infomercial king, if anyone has heard of him, and uh, Ben Settle. And Ben Settle talk, you know, talks about Vance, and they know each other. Uh, and he says, Vance is by far the single best resource for learning how to merge customer service with direct response marketing to exponentially ratchet up sales uh, that he's ever heard. And, and Ben does not give those things out lightly, uh, if anyone knows Ben. So um, this episode is brought to you by uh, Rise25. At Rise25, we help people give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships, partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Vance, and I know for you is the same. The number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way to do that over the past 10 years to profile the people and companies I admire and share their information and what they're doing and what they're learning and teaching with the world. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should uh, go to rise25.com. And if you have questions, email us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. We've been doing it for over a decade. So um, without further ado, Vance Morris, uh, he's a retired, as I mentioned, Walt Disney World Resort leader, having spent 10 years at the resorts, he you know, ran the Disney service and, and basically now he runs the Disney service and direct response marketing business on the planet. And I don't, you know, like Ben Settle uh, said it best, he coaches companies to create Disney style service systems and then monetize them through direct response marketing. He's also the longest reigning marketer of the year at GKIC. That's a huge feat. People that don't know GKIC, you could check it out. I've had a number of people were involved with uh, GKIC. I had uh, Adam Witte at one point owned uh, GKIC and other people. So, uh, but he went from, he didn't start off like that. Uh, you know, Vance, you know, kind of uh, told me, and I don't know if I'm supposed to mention, I'll mention anyways, but for the former birth control factory security guard, turned Disney leader, turned Bainbrook, auto work executive, turn carpet cleaning, turn successful entrepreneur. So there's a lot to unpack there. So Vance, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, this will be fun. That's the most I talk throughout the whole time. And the rest is all about you. But um, I want to start off with experience out of the mundane. Okay. Talk about what that means. And yeah. we'll talk about some examples. Yeah, sure. So we all have mundane things that we need to do in our business to get through the day. Answer email, answer the phone. Uh, maybe we send proposals, uh, we send out packages, um, or we fulfill orders. Um, and many times that is just done functionally with no thought to the end experience of the person who's going to be receiving it. Um, so when we Disneyfy, we look at the entire customer journey. I, I call it customer mapping. And at each interaction point uh, with the client or the patient, um, we identify that and we say, okay, what are we doing now? And how do we plus it, or how do we create an experience out of it? And we start at number one. So if the first experience with your company is a, a postcard or a phone call, well, that's where we start. So one, one of the uh, examples, I think this illustrates it best, 
uh, is uh, with the insurance world. Now, I don't know how many of your listeners are insurance agents, um, and I don't want to insult any of them, So, but I might. Uh, so if, normally they're kind of a stodgy bunch, uh, you know, very, they just kind of just get through the day. Um, however, um, one of my clients, I spoke to a group of um, insurance agents a couple of years ago, and I asked the question, I usually do this in front of every audience. I said, how do you answer the phone? And, you know, two, three people raise their hand. They say, you know, thank you for calling Sam's Allstate. How can I help you? And we've all called companies and gotten some version of that, um, that phone. A buddy of mine, not a buddy, client, uh, who is a giant rock and roll fanatic. I mean, he's got Jimi Hendrix and Who posters uh, in his office, you know, gold records, autographed guitars. I mean, just rock and roll nut. Um, that's just his personality. So now we're already, we haven't even done anything yet. And he's already separated himself from all of the other insurance agents in his town because he lets his personality come through in the office. So instead of ask, answering the phone in a very mundane way, which is, you know, thank you for calling Dave's Allstate. How can I help you? He has his team. Now, the first time you hear it, it sounds corny. But once you say it and you understand why he says it, you'll be like, oh, my God, that's great. So he has his team answer the phone. Thank you for calling Dave's Allstate, the agency that rocks. Now, what? remember, your marketing does two things. It's supposed to attract the people you want to do business with and repel the people you don't want to do business with. So if you don't, you know, don't like hanging out with, you know, people that are just price shoppers and stick in the muds, answering the phone this way is an easy way to sift, sort and screen out people you don't want on your list. Um, it's also memorable. It's also an experience. People will come away from that saying, oh, my God. When I called the insurance company today, you'll never guess what he said. Um, and that's the phrase you want your clients or patients saying to their friends or family when they go home after, after having an experience with you. You'll never guess what happened at, insert your profession or your store there. I mean, when was the last time you sat around the dinner table with the family and said, man, you'll never guess what happened at the oil change today. <laughs> yeah, that, got, that conversation never happens anywhere. Um, but if you answer the phone in the manner I suggested, or if you uh, have my carpet cleaning come to your home um, and uh, we do our whole dog and pony show to get into your home, which if you want me to talk about, I can. But you will go home and you will sit at the dinner table. And you will never guess what the carpet cleaner did when he got to my house today. Yeah, I mean, That's you help you, you help these businesses. You go into business, help them. But you also run brick and mortar businesses. So talk I about do. some of the, the stuff that you employ in, in the carpet cleaning business. Sure. Well, if you think about the carpet cleaning industry on the home service totem pole, uh, you know, you got electricians and plumbers, you know, way at the top and then. Carpet cleaners are down below, just underneath pest control and water treatment companies. Uh, so 2020 did an expose on us back in the 90s. So um, we're not exactly held in high regard. So obviously, I want to, I set out to change that. Um, and just for a basis for, for you and your listeners, my company, uh, my prices are about 35% higher than my closest competitor. Um, so by doing experiences and providing experiences, you get that price elasticity. So one of the mundane things we have to do is get into the client's home. We can't get in. We can't do the cleaning. So we've created an experience around this entire event. Now, notice there's two things to unpack there. One is I said we. I did not come up with this on my own. I brought the guys in who go out and do this job every day brought them in for them to help out because I don't want to just dictate what I think is a great idea might suck. So um, we don't do that. So when my guys get to the house, they park in, and this is all completely scripted. They park their van in the street. We don't park in the driveway because God forbid I've got an oil leak and now I've got to clean something else up. 
They get out of the car. They're in a clean, crisp new uniform because they carry extra uniforms in the van in case they get dirty on the first job. They walk up to the front door. They got a special uh, mat that they're going to lay down. They have their tool bag and they have a little uh, gift box. They knock on the door. They don't ring the bell because friends knock, salespeople ring. They take two steps back from the screen because the last thing you want is big six foot three, 200 pound Stephen, you know, staring in the face when 89 year old Mrs. McGillicuddy answers the door. So he takes a step back, waits for the door, uh, says, hi, uh, my name is Stephen. I'm here to create your healthy home. May I come in? And then we wait to be invited into the home. Now, I mentioned he has a gift. Now, this is something that nobody else does in my area, and you may not have it done in your area either. When was the last time a home service company came to your house and presented you with a gift? I'm not talking refrigerator magnet or a, you know, a crappy pen. I'm talking a real gift. Never. Does it ever happen? Never for me, no. Never for you. I, I'm batting a thousand on that question. So my guys have a gift. That's not a huge thing, but it is a nice custom-made blue box. And inside the box is a bottle of spot remover, a bag of cookies, and a little note from me thanking um, the client for allowing us to come into their home. If they have any questions, here's my personal cell phone number. You have me at the um, bag of cookies. I'm already, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm already so loving good. it. Yeah. Um, so, so the so it's a real gift. So it's not just a little chat keys that I you know give out that's going to get thrown away or you know it's it it's real tangible stuff. Gift cost me like five bucks all in. But when you when I did that gift, it started two processes. The first is one obviously it's an experience that somebody is going to talk about. You'll never guess what happened when the carpet cleaner showed up at my front door today. He gave me a gift. The other thing it starts is a process called reciprocity. So, you know, think about, it. you know, if you ever go to a, a friend's house for dinner, or, you know, you're going to bring, you know, wine or beer or some hors d'oeuvres or something. Well, I feel the same way. We're going to somebody's house. So I'm going to bring a little housewarming, a little gift. Um, when we implemented that gift, remember, it cost me five bucks. When we implemented that gift, I had a 26% increase in our mid-tier package, which translated into an additional $65,000 a year in income just by that gift. I love it. What strikes me, Vance, when I did research for this is you're really big on systems and service and combining those two, like you just said, it's not like you... Dep- you know, it's not like you are like, leave it to chance, right? He's like, here's the right. system. Here's what you do. You, st- I mean, it's, it's to the T you step back, you don't, you know, everything is designed around that experience. Absolutely. And it's documented. Um, so, you know, my guys have a binder in the van because that's one of the things, you know, when you're, if you have employees, the last thing you want to do is compare them to other employees. Well, you know, Fred does it this way. Jane does it that way. You should be more like Fred or Jane. That's, this is the worst thing you could do. We compare to the standards. Here's the standard. Here's how we approach the door. And we measure you against that, not against somebody else. So having that as a, uh, excuse me, um, you know, as a written standard, you just, it's easy to refer to. And it's a great training tool for um, if you have new hires. Yeah. You mentioned the um, insurance industry, and I know you work with a lot of different types of industries, you know, uh, lawyers, orthodontists. Um, so in the case of lawyers for a second, I'd love to talk about the phone. Cause like sometimes again, in all these offices, <clears throat> the phone is the first impression that, that people have a lot of times. And so talk about maybe some examples of things that you've instructed or you've seen things that are do well as far as the phone or the opposite uh, as far as maybe lawyers or orthodontists? Well, sure. You know, I, I think first and foremost, the person or persons answering the phone um, have to have the feeling that they matter. Um, and by just calling them a receptionist or a customer service rep, doesn't do anything for their egos, and it's certainly not going to boost them up. Uh, one of the things I recommend uh, is giving them a real title. Now, you know, there's variations of, uh, 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 we have one, it's director of first impressions. Uh, another one could be, uh, you know, chief happiness officer. 
Um, but putting real tangible yeah. things behind those titles now, and then you got to give them a card, you, you know, and put on there, you know, director of first impressions. Well, now I love that about that Vance is it, it enforces what the purpose of the job is. And so exactly. I love it. Yeah. You know, and so, um, you know, what do we want this person to do? So at Disney, and this is one of the things that I teach, is the five and 10 rule. So this would be for a live uh, office. If you were to walk into an office um, at 10 feet away, your employee does X. So when the customer, the client is walking towards you at 10 feet, you whatever you want to do, I usually say at least acknowledge the person, look up from what you're doing, uh, you know, wave if you're on the phone, something. And then at five feet, so when they're five feet away from you, then you do why, okay? Maybe that's uh, stand up, walk around the desk, shake a hand, uh, greet them by name. Hopefully, you know that they've got an appointment and you say, oh, Mrs. Smith, you know, welcome to the office. Great to see you. Um, and then offer a beverage or, or what have you. Um, so, I mean, there's re- all sorts of ways that, and once you give this title and you, and you anoint this person, um, let them come up with ways, how can we make the best first impression? You know, maybe they're in charge of the physical plant of your reception area. So, you know, carpets are clean, plants aren't dusty, uh, the windows look good. I mean, give them real responsibilities um, around that title and watch them take ownership of that. And Ownership. Disney tried this back in the 90s to give us managers ownership. And we all fought back. We're like, are you kidding me? You know, we don't have enough, you know, shares in our 401k plan to even remotely consider ourselves owners. Why should we try and do that? But when they changed the title to proprietor, Mm. now, you know, now you're not blowing smoke. Now you are, oh, all right, I have full operational control over. This area, I am its proprietor, and I will treat it as such. Um, so, yeah, I know, noticed that with Disney, there's titles even for I. I mean, I don't know. There's so other ones like people who, you know, pick up the trash. That's not their their title. There, there's a variety. I would of, be a cast uh, member. A cast member, exactly right. So there's a variety from any of the positions. Seem like they have those yeah. type of titles to them. Yeah, and you got to remember, and this is going to go off. This is like squirrel. We're going to go off a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody at Disney is called a cast member. The frontline employees are called hosts and hostesses. Again, Walt wanted it to feel like he was welcoming you into your home. And that's what a host or hostess did. They welcomed you. Um, but you have to have a mission that is greater than your job. And what I mean by that is, is not a mission statement. So, I mean, we've all seen these gobbledygook, you know, three inch big binders with mission statements. They got them made on a poster, hanging on the wall in the hallway. Yeah, it it never ceases to amaze me when I go into an office for the first time and I'll ask, so what's your mission? And then there and there's Marge at the desk. Trying to look around me, you know, at the mission statement on the wall behind me to read it. Um, And I'm like, "Ah, this is. A mission is a simple explanation that any minimum wage employee can wrap their head around. So at Disney, the mission is to make people happy. Boom, that's it. Jeez, I can wrap my head around that. So my job is to sweep the streets, but my mission is to make people happy. So how do we how do we do that? You know, our in my carpet cleaning business, our mission is to create healthy homes. How do we achieve that? By cleaning. So your mission always needs to be bigger than your, uh, your actual job. Yeah. So I love that. And someone comes in and I, in the, um, from the, the phone answering piece, um, the, I saw that insurance person kind of does it in a unique way. What are some good ways, whether it's an orthodontist office or a law office uh, that they can, you've seen put their installed their personality into it or their company's personality into it in a, in a good way. Sure. You know, I, I, um, 
you know, one, one orthodontist I worked with was, you know, uh, you know, I said, thank you for calling Dr. Dr. Smith's office, uh, the home of a million smiles. That was the mission of that office yeah. was to create a million smiles. Yeah. All the employees were able to wrap their heads around yeah. it. Um, so a lot of times, you know, that embedding the that mission page. into how they're answering the phone is critical. And then everyone who calls understands yep. the mission, too. Yep. And then and you that staff say, member st- talking, basically, yeah. it'd be impossible for them to forget that mission. If yeah. they're, they're saying it 20 times a day. You know, and you don't want it to be hokey or insincere. You know, I mean, there's some you answer the phone and you know that they are being forced to say something that just is very insincere. You know, thank you for calling the happiest customer service department in the world. <laughs> yeah, right. Tell me another one. In, in the opposite respect, Vance, and I remember, I think, I don't know if you have any yet, but you should uh, have. Uh, grocery store clients. Um, but there's a story that you talk about where the opposite happened. You were in line at a retail store and there was a huge opportunity for them. And we see this they all the time, it. but what did, yeah. What did you see <laughs> there? <laughs> they blow it. Well, here's the frightening thing. I'll, I'll tell the story. The frightening thing is though, that it's happening more often than you would expect. So the story goes, um, I, and I will fully admit, I am not handy with tools. Um, I don't, I, I hang a picture, that's it. No electricity, no plumbing, nothing. So I was at my local uh, retail hardware store, but the, you know, the big box one. Can I say their name? If you want to, yeah. That's uh, well, I mean, I, it doesn't know, matter to me. All right, good. So anyway, I was at the blue guys, Lowe's. Um, which, by the way, their stock price is lower than the orange guy's Home Depot. And you'll see from this example why that is. Um, so I had my stuff in my cart um, and I was standing in line at the checkout and there were two guys ahead of me. And I noticed that the cashier was not saying anything to anybody. No good morning. No, did you find everything OK? Nothing. She was having wordless transactions with uh, the customers. Now. That just bothers me. Uh, it should bother everybody. Uh, but when I got up there, I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to make a game out of this. I'm not going to say anything, and I'm going to make her say the first thing. So I get up there. Have you ever played that game where, you know, like team building things where they make you sit in a circle and be silent for 60 seconds and how awkward. awkward that gets? Yeah. I hate that. Well, imagine being, you know, a foot, two feet away from another human being and having absolute science for two silence for two and a half minutes as she brings up my items. I mean, she didn't say good morning. She didn't say, did you find everything? Okay. She didn't say my, that's a nice shovel and bag of dirt. You got there. Nothing. And I even tried to get her to say stuff. I mean, I, I did the whole uh, eyeball thing, you know, you know, staring right at her, trying to get her to say nothing. The criminal thing was that her manager was not two registers away, leaning on a pole, thumbing on his uh, on his doodad on his phone. So he should be fired. She needs to be retrained. I mean, this is criminal. So I say, you know, I got other stops I need to make uh, today. I'm going to do an unscientific survey and I'm going to see how many companies will um, talk to me first or acknowledge me before I have to say something. And this was, you know, big box stores, franchises, mom and pops, the gamut. Six out of nine companies did not say one thing to me. We had wordless transactions. Six out of nine. It would have been seven out of nine, except that I had to order the hamburger at the McDonald's. It would have been seven, but but I had to order. Now, McDonald's, of course, is now taking the humans out of it. And you can just go and punch your, your order in on a screen. So, okay, fine. Um, but I don't think we all in our worlds want to do that or can do that. So six out of nine companies, is that happening in your business? I mean, when was the last time you secret shopped your business? Yeah. You know, I oh, tell, to- I, totally. I mean, you, you, um, I was a secret a shopper for a restaurant chain and they had okay. me go in my wife and I go in and they they had specific things exactly you know first of all if you're investing money 
in Secret Shopper, as you know, that you care about customer service and, and, the, yep. and experience in the first place. But they had the same thing. If the person has to acknowledge you and say certain things and you check those off, not just acknowledging, but what they say. So right. those are the people that care. And those are the, the you know, the places that people go back to time and time again. Now, doctors, though, doctors, for some reason, it doesn't matter which what uh, niche of doctor, dentist, medical, you know, orthodontist, pediatrician, whatever. They never walk through their front doors. I don't know why, but all the doctors have a little secret door in the back that they park their car. They walk in the little back door and they never go out to the lobby. They never go out front. Everybody, this is the only thing you do from this call. If you've never been in your lobby and walk through it in the footsteps of one of your guests or patients, go do that and think about what do you see? You know, you'll be amazed. I mean, really, if you've never done it, do it. You'll be like, when, when did that plant die? When did the paint get chipped? When did the window get dirty? When did Marge shrink? And all we can see is the top of her head over the desk. Um you know, Even better, Vance, is have your significant other do it because they will then rag on you. Uh, I'm not saying this from experience. This is a friend. Yeah. <laughs> they will come through the front door and be like, rag on you on what they're seeing. So, yep. <laughs> so it could be you or throw on one of your significant because they will hold you to the fire to fix those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's all about changing your perspective and changing your point of view. Um, and, I, and I tell people, put that on your calendar, you know, once a month, once a week, whatever. Change up your routine so that you see something different in your business. Now, whether that's physically in your business, you know, if you're an online retailer, dude, when was the last time you went through your sales funnel, uh, your online uh, purchasing funnel? You know, that's what Disney is so good at is removing the barriers to the sale or removing barriers to service. Yeah. They, I mean, they're masters at extracting money from your wallet and making you feel good about it. Yeah. I want to talk about Disney and some of the things that you did there so we can learn from, from your lessons. I do want to give a sure. shout out to Austin Clark of the Multiply You podcast. He actually owns a, a chain of pest control business. You mentioned pest control. So yep. he'll love this episode. Austin, if you're listening, you know, listen to this and uh, people can check out his podcast as well. Um, you may even be a great guest. I'll mention you, Vance, to, to oh, Austin. But um, talk about Disney, some of the things that you did there and, and lessons at Disney. Sure. Holy cow. Where to start? Um, well, I can tell you what not to do. OK. Uh, one of the things is uh, know who your target demographic is. Now, we'll talk direct response here. I was doing direct response and didn't know it at the time. Um, see, Disney had massive failures. I mean, you know, we all make mistakes, but when Disney makes a mistake, I mean, they go all in. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, just think Grand Floridian, lake, no barrier to lake, small child walks into lake, alligator eats child. You know, that, that's the kind of mistakes that Disney makes. And they made this with Pleasure Island. Now, I don't know if you were ever there. This was Disney's uh, attempt at nighttime entertainment, booze, debauchery, scantily clad women, etc. It's gone now. It's now uh, part of uh, um, not Disney Marketplace. Uh, God, they changed the name of it so many times. I forget. Disney Springs. Um, so the retail and shopping district. When I was there, I, now I was a nightclub manager for four years and a duty manager there for three and a half. The theme of Pleasure Island, one, it was literally an island. So it was a five-acre island with seven nightclubs on it. Now we're thinking nightclubs, Disney. Hmm, how does, how does this go together? Um, not very well. They had nightclubs. One nightclub was called The Cage. I'm not kidding you. The Cage. And what was inside the cage? Cages. What were in the cages? Scantily clad Disney cast members gyrating to the music i'm, I'm not making this up this uh, is real i was just at disney you know as i was saying um uh a couple weeks ago and so i can't even picture that compared yeah. to my experience oh my god yeah. yeah so that that did this was actually uh the only part this is pre 9 11 the only 
a Disney park that had Orange County sheriffs parked out front from the minute we opened to the minute we closed. And they were on horseback. Where do you see police on horseback? At riots. We had signs out front that said, no colors. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever been to a bar or a club or a restaurant and the sign out front says no colors, that means no gang colors. So we had gangs. This is not good. Um, Now, let's think about Pleasure Island and demographics. This was back in the 80s when they were designing it. They realized that at at the parks, um, at the resorts, you know, Disneyland and Disney World, that they were missing a demographic of the ages of like 18 to 30 um, because they were too old uh, to enjoy the parks, the rides and the stuff themselves. And they weren't old enough to have kids to bring to the park. So they said, what can we do for this age demographic, 18 to 30? Ah, let's open a bar. Let's open a whole bunch of them. Great in theory, not so great in implementation. Um, I mean, think about where the guests have been all day long, right? They've been in the theme parks. They are probably malnourished, dehydrated, and, you know, sunburned. Um, And we're going to bring them to a place at 7 o'clock at night and shove a couple of beers in them. Now, let's see what happens. Um, I mean, think about it. This is is not good. Um, I actually was the uh, manager of the Rock and Roller Dome. Okay. Now, just from the title of the name of the club, it's Rock and Roll, but it had roller in it. So what do we do? We're going to take those dehydrated, malnourished, and sunburned tourists, shove a couple of beers on them, put wheels on their feet, and see what the heck happens. It it was a roller skating rink. I mean, every night, we just parked the ambulance out back. Every night, some idiot was falling over, breaking an arm. Um, That didn't last long. I think it was like about a year and a half before they finally got rid of it. So the, the demographic was correct. The implementation was horrible. Um, so there's other things they could do, um, to get around that. So when Disney makes mistakes, they make big ones. Um, I think the biggest lesson that I, that anybody could take from Disney and and you've already alluded to it is systems. Uh, Disney has a system for everything. You want to change a bus tire. You want to wait on a table. You want to, you know, make a movie. Disney has a system Um, and they're simple systems. I mean, if you think about it, if you go to a theme park, I mean, Disney's got in Orlando alone, they got 85,000 employees, right? In one, one resort. If they had complex systems, the place would fall apart. Nobody would be able to do anything. I mean, remember, I mean, the average age of the theme park worker is, you know, like 19. Um, So how do we get 19 year olds who, Trust me, operating It's a Small World is not in the forefront of their mind as a 19-year-old kid. You're thinking, where can I get beer when I'm underage? And you're thinking about girls and you're thinking about going to the beach. Uh, You're not thinking about pushing a button to get people on It's a Small World. Um, So if the systems were difficult, they wouldn't be able to get it done. So they're simple. Um, And that's when we, when I created Chef Mickey's with the uh, entertainment folks, um, which was my my big hoo-ha. If you've ever been to Chef Mickey's in the Contemporary Resort, uh, that was my creation. Um, and uh, actually operated that for uh, for four years. So a um, lot of fun. But I More fun everything. than the, the cage? Cage nightclub? <laughs> AK, which was not my, okay. not my thing. Um, you know, I was, it's funny, I was the duty manager for Pleasure Island for, um, for three years, which means I was in charge of the island every night, five nights a week, um, which, by the way, the theme for the island was New Year's Eve every night. And so I don't do New Year's Eve anymore because I have 1,126 of them under my belt right now. So I'm not touching it. Nine o'clock, out. Ryan Seacrest, whoever, I'm, nope, don't care. Um, where was How did you come up with Chef Mickey's? Sure. Well, Chef Mickey's uh, was a restaurant 
in the Disney Village Marketplace, which is now Disney Springs. Um, we at the Contemporary, I was brought on for a revitalization of the resorts. One of the things that Disney did really well was theme parks. One of the things they didn't do so well was hotels and restaurants and resorts. Um, and they realized that a lot of people would come to Disney if they could have an, they're not theme park people, but if we gave them a great experience at a resort, they would come. Because before the resorts were just, well, we got theme parks. We need some place for them to sleep. All right, we'll build a hotel. <laughs> that was the extent of it. Um, so they knew, and this was again, uh, early 90s, they knew that they needed to put their best foot forward. And one, because they were going to start building a lot of them, they needed to get their act together. Um, so I was on the revitalization team of the Contemporary, and uh, we shut down. Uh, we had a character dining experience there, Chippendale and uh, a couple of the other B characters, you know, Goofy and I don't know, somebody. Um, and we said, uh, you know, how can we, you know, how can we really make this? Um, at the same time, it was just stars aligned. Uh, they were shutting down Chef Mickey's at the village um, and for a, a renovation. And they needed a home for Chef Mickey's. So we're like, hey, we'll take him. Um, so we created a better home for, for the mouse than the village marketplace could. Now, this is where systems come in and your mission. So our mission for Chef Mickey's was we needed to get 400 people through the restaurant in 43 minutes and have it be a great experience. Now, you could look at it and say, oh, crap, that just sounds like, you know, cattle rustling for crying out loud. 400 people, 43 minutes and have it be a great experience. Well, if you break it down. So the reason we do, well, 400 seats is easy. There's 400 seats in the restaurant. 43 minutes is the amount of time a table for two took to dine in the restaurant. Um, and of course, we had Mickey Mouse in the restaurant. So in order for it to be a great experience, everybody had to have a chance to see Mickey. Um, you know, because if you go to a theme park, you wait in line to see the characters. Oh, my God. We were on when a Disney go- cruise, Vance, and I'm like... Oh, yeah. I could have read three novels in waiting in line for the princesses. It was, I'm like, seriously. And yep. by the way, it wasn't just kids. There were like couples, like older couples there. I'm like waiting for their kids to come, but the couple, they wanted to be in line yeah. and meet the princesses. I was oh, like, yeah. wow, this is yeah, amazing. It's, insanity. it's amazing. Yeah. You know, if you ever want to mortify your 11 year old daughter, after she gets a picture with uh, the princess, you sit down and get one. <laughs> so I got 20 pictures of Snow White, Ariel, and all of them. And my daughter was just freaking out uh, that I did. So this I, I totally can empathize and sympathize with how is Mickey going to get around to like every right. single. Yes. So keep going. So um, so in. And so we did table for two because as the table size grew, the length of time that they dined extended as well. Um, So we went to the entire team and we said, look, 400 seats, 43 minutes, great experience. How do we do it? Uh, So this is where the processes and systems came in place and going to the individual departments and employees. So, for example, uh, the bus boys. Now, those are the guys that clean up the tables um, after the guests leave. They said, well, look, it takes us three minutes to turn over a table. Get the dirty stuff off, put the clean stuff down and have it ready for the next guest. We could probably shave some time off if we could just come up with some way to capture the salt and pepper shaker and the sugar boats and the little signs and all the crap we got on the table that we have to move to clean to put back. We just had that in a, in a box or a basket that would really speed up the time. Great. We made a basket. And inside of that went the salt, pepper, sugar, sweeteners, all that stuff. Um, shaved uh, 28 seconds off of uh, the time. And we did that with each and every department. How do we, you know, the entertainment department, because everybody wants their, you know, their picture with the mouse for the birthday, you know, the anniversary, the bar mitzvah, the divorce, whatever they're celebrating, (laughs) they need. So instead of trying to capture the mouse for those individual pictures, we came up with a celebration song. and. 
Guess how often that celebration song went out? Every 42 minutes. So everybody gets up, they twirl their napkins, the characters are dancing, people get up and dance, and then they all sit back down again. So now we've recognized the birthdays without slowing down the characters. Because we had to get the characters. You know, the mouse had to see all 400 seats. And the only way to do that is if we had stuff in place that allowed them uh, to do that. So, um, oh, you'll love this one. So I don't know if you've worked in, uh, you know, corporate places where you've got peers. You know, we were, I, was a, uh, I was a director at the resort, reported to a general manager, and there was like a you know, housekeeping director, executive housekeeper, et cetera. And uh, one of the things, you know, this is how strong our mission was. Um, oh, before I go too far, let me just give you an idea how big this restaurant is. All right. When I was there, OK, this is back in the 90s. Those 400 seats generated twenty eight million dollars a year. One restaurant. Now, with all the price increases and they've added like 50 seats to it. It's approaching $65 million a year, one restaurant. So this is just to give you the scope and the size of what we're talking about. Um, so we're sitting at the, um, uh, this is what gave me a little bit of uh, confidence when I approached the executive housekeeper on this. So we're sitting at our uh, team meeting and I said, you know, we're great at entertaining. We're great at cooking food. We're great at serving food. But, you know, we are not ex experts in cleaning. And, you know, and I look at the housekeeper and he's like, all right. I said, look, when somebody barfs in the restaurant, we have to take our time to clean it up. They're either a busboy, a server, a manager. Somebody's got to stop their duties. And if we do that, we're not going to be able to get the mouse through 400 seats in 43 minutes and have it be a great time. Since you, Mr. Executive Housekeeper, are the expert in cleaning, could we just have a hotline to your department? And anytime some kid barfs in the, in the restaurant, we just call you. Of course, he's turning nine shades of purple because he's, you know, irritated with me. But I had already cleared it with my boss who thought it was a great idea. Um, and reason, the other reason that, that it's not that we serve bad food, that the kids were getting sick. It's that it was an all-you-can-eat buffet, which included an all-you-can-eat dessert buffet. And since they're on vacation, the kids usually started with the soft serve ice cream. And, you know, I mean, they just had the mountainous uh, uh, you know, Sunday um, started there. So. So anyway, that's those were the systems, processes and things that we did to uh, to make. Yeah, sure like to go, to kind of go around any big hiccups that would put a big wrench in the whole yep. process and system. So exactly. Let's talk about, you know, with what you do now um, and. Um, Balanganza. Is that pronounced okay. right? Belaganza. Belaganza. What talk about so so I can understand a little bit more about your process and your think your thought process and what you do. Sure. Talk about that. Sure. So Belaganza was was the first uh, talk about a commodity business. The first shampoo company to create shampoos without silicone. Evidently, I'm not a hairdresser, but evidently silicone is not good for you, regardless of where it is on your body. Um, and they had they were literally um, the hairdressers to the stars. They had A and B list movie people. They got testimonials out the hoo-ha from uh, 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 movie stars and things like that. But obviously they needed to have a broader appeal. Um, so we looked at their processes, we looked at the experience, and we started to, uh, you know, Walt Disney called it plussing, which is constant process improvement. And we said, one, and you'll, you'll like this and probably agree, the one thing they were not doing was a print newsletter. Now, there is no competition in the mailbox anymore. Start a print newsletter. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, but start it, get it out there. So, you know, you, you support your clients, you put their people's names in lights, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that they were doing was when they shipped the product, this is going in a plain brown box that you could get from Uline, um, if you're familiar with the, the box company. Um, I said, well, how can we make this better? Um, and they said, well, um, you know, maybe we could do uh, some tissue paper and make the packaging look a little better. Okay, 
Great. Iteration number one. What else can we do? Well, um, you know, they're ordering, um, uh, you know, a special shampoo that's supposed to help hair growth. Uh, maybe we could put in a little brochure or postcard that says, uh, you know, here's some success stories and the best way to use the product. Okay, great. What else? Uh, why don't we, uh, can we put in a sample for conditioner? Okay, great. What else? Why don't we design a custom box? And then have, you know, the phone, because this is really expensive shampoo. This is not your $2 bottle that you go to the drugstore, the grocery store and get. I mean, this is like, you know, $76 for eight ounces. Um, I said, at that price point, you know, we should present this a little bit better. So we had a custom box made. We had the inserts made, you know, that foam stuff where you can, you know, that's perfectly cut out for the thing that you put in there. Uh, we had that done. And then this is the key thing is you got to test stuff. So we mailed this box to ourselves. Postal service is not very dainty when it comes to handling packages. So we found that the box got the living crap beat out of it between, you know, our house, the post office and coming back. Um, so we got one of those plain U-line boxes and we dropped the gift box looking thing inside that box. Um, now, Disney does this because, you know, think about uh, if you did this around the holidays. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of people stealing packages off of porches, uh, you know, Christmas gifts and things like that. Um, so Disney actually does. When you buy something from Disney, if you go to a Disney store or uh, back when they used to send, sell you the uh, magic bands, um, it came in a plain brown box. Now, when you open the box. Then the surprises, and it's all full of colors, and there's a nice presentation of the band, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we did, everything's done in iterations. Don't try and do things, you know, oh, my God, it's got to be a perfect package before it goes out. No, just add one thing. Get it out the door. All right, two months later, six months later, next thing. Get it out the door. Um, one of the other big things that he did not have, and this is where revenue comes into play, um, is he did not have a membership program. Nothing. I mean, he had reminders, you know, people would say, or, or auto ship, you know, every 60 days, he'd send out a new bottle of shampoo. But he didn't have any kind of membership or reoccurring revenue. You know, you're in that kind of business where you could create membership similar to Amazon Prime. You know, can you give free shipping for $19 a month? So, yeah, I could certainly do that. So now we just I, we just did a mastermind meeting last week with him. Uh, he implemented his uh, uh, membership program at nine dollars a month. He's going to have levels, so we started at nine, and uh, he immediately, if we annualize it, he's going to bring in a hundred thousand dollars this year just on nine dollar memberships. Amazing, amazing. Then, um. I love those ideas. Um, you also did some work with uh, Burleson and Burleson Summit. Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to In Your Face Podcast, which has orthodontic leaders. But yeah, let's Thank talk you. about that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, orthodontists, you know, similar. Um, you know, the in-office experience is something that really needs to be, you know, looked at and digested and, and rethought. Uh, I mean, what is, when you go to a dentist or an orthodontist, what are the senses that are activated when you walk into that office? Number one is sound. Whee! You know, all you hear is that drill going in the back. You're like, oh, God, that's coming for me. Um, the other thing is smell. Now, smell is the number one sense when it comes to memories. So if you walk into a dentist office and you smell antiseptic, that gritty toothpaste that they use, and you're hearing, Wee! you're automatically put in a state of fear of, oh my God, what are they going to do to me? So how do we get rid of all that? Well, one, you should have a door. Okay, have a door, put a door in so that the back office and the, and the reception area are separated and you don't hear that noise. The other thing, start cooking something, chicken soup, Cookies, the smell of fresh baked cookies in the office is absolutely amazing. And how many dentists' office, when you walk in, or orthodontists, have that aroma of 
fresh and any office can do this fresh baked cookies it's so much better than you know we and you know I, I still remember i stayed i went to a colts game in indianapolis uh and the hotel we stayed at would cook otis spunkmeyer oh, yeah. cookies and not only would it smell but they would give you one I don't think I've had any other hotel do that. I still remember that. And I would go back to the hotel just for those fresh baked cookies. Yeah, Hilton. I think it's Hilton so, does that. Does yeah. it? Okay. Oh, yeah. No. So that, anyways, it's, yes, I'm, I'm with you. But it triggers, like I said, memory. Smell is the number one sense when it comes to memory. So um, very smart to trigger that. The other thing that they were really lacking in was retail sales. Uh, you know, Teeth whiteners and toothbrushes and whatever other stuff, you know, you, you can buy there. I was like, well, where is it? Because I didn't see it. I was, oh, it's behind the counter. What's it doing there? You can't sell it from back there. Nobody sees it. So we literally just took the, gla- the case that the stuff was in from behind the desk to the front of the desk, right where you got to check out to make your next appointment. I mean, 500% increase in, in, in retail sales in an orthodontist office just by moving the case. You know, they started ordering and their supplier was like, did something go bad or something go wrong? You never order this much. Because, oh, no, we just figured out how to sell it. You know. I love it. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. and then um, also um, talk about work with um, Ben Glass and some of the lessons yeah. there. Yeah, so uh, Ben and I have done, uh, we've been working together for a number of years. I uh, come speak at his masterminds and his events. Uh, We are actually going on a trip to Disney. Um, I do these four or five times a year. Uh, Go to, uh, and we do three-day boot camps at Disney. So it's half in the parks, half in classroom. Um, One of the things that Ben loves about uh, working, I think he loves working with me. Um, I'm putting words in his mouth here. Uh, (laughs) uh, But is the fact that we build processes, we build a plan, we build a blueprint, because I get, I don't know, maybe attorneys are just analytical that way, or maybe they're not and they need a plan. Um, But he loves the fact that we are able to systemize and and codify an actual plan and measure its ROI when we implement that plan. Because remember, direct response marketing, if you can't measure it, well, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, and so we do that with the experience as well. Um, so, you know, implementing uh, uh, one of the big things we implemented uh, was the, uh, uh, the winning the case party. You know, so if you were injured in an auto accident and, you know, you just got a million dollars or any settlement or won the case, you know, one attorney friend of mine in Wichita threw, literally threw a huge party, you know, balloons, cake, you know, everybody from the offices came out to congratulate, um, you know, that person. You used to do that and they never do this anymore. If you remember the car company Saturn back in the 90s, they don't make Saturns anymore, but they would have what they called a launch. And you literally got in your Saturn in the showroom Everybody gathered around, all the salespeople, and they opened the big doors in the front of the showroom and you drove your new car out. Now, Ford doesn't do that. Buick doesn't do that. Um, But I remember I bought like three Saturns back in the 90s. And I remember it because all three times I got to drive out of the showroom in it. If Van, someone's listening to this and this and they're like, this sounds amazing. I want to take my group or company and you say you do this once a quarter or whatever it is. How does it work if someone wants to, to do that? With yeah, you? sure. So I'm, uh, I mean, the real quick detail is, you know, minimum 12 people uh, because that way we can get a room block. We get great rates on the hotels. Uh, usually I can get 65, 70% off uh, rack rate, um, which is a lot at Disney. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly uh, we can put a group together. Uh, it can be maybe just your office. If you've got a large team and you want to uh, do this, um, maybe you're in a mastermind or in a business group um, and you get a number of people together. Um, it's a turnkey event. I do everything. Um, you know, all the emails are written. All of my webinars are done for you, et cetera, et cetera. There's really nothing you got to do except market it. And I give you all those materials. Um, and I also do uh, JV shares on it. Um, you know, you pay me my cost plus, um, I, again, I do all the legwork with Disney. 
Um, and then you get to charge whatever price point you want based on your uh, your niche and what your members or, or uh, clients can can bear. Typically, that a one person ticket's going for anywhere between four and five thousand dollars, but it's all inclusive. Park tickets are included, rooms included, all your food is included. Um, all the training is included, the materials, the blueprints, et cetera. So people so, have you know. time to go to the parks as well? Is oh, thing? yeah, we do. Yeah. I, call them, I call it a walking classroom. So we'll spend half the day in a, in a, you know, in a conference room or a ballroom, and then we'll spend half the day uh, in the parks. Mm-hmm. How um, many days is it usually? Three. Three days. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, first of all, Vance, this has been amazing. Um, and I want to circle back to the beginning of our conversation. And where I mentioned Ben Settle and some of the oh. lessons you learned uh, with working alongside Ben. Oh, my. Where to start? <laughs> uh, ben has been very generous. He he realized, you know, that um, having an, ex- an experience for his members um, and having his own world. Ben's very big on world building. And I think that's probably why you, not building literal planets, but building your world and how you operate and what you stand for and how you let your personality out. Um, and I think that's Ben and I, you know, really clicked there. Um, and he, uh, we did a program together actually uh, last year. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, Ultimate Client Experience for Coaches, Copywriters, and Info Marketers. Um, so we took everything that I teach Disney-wise and taught it to copywriters and info marketers. Um, and really, Ben and I were on the call at the same time. I probably did 98% of the talking, but his 2% was just incredible. He goes, oh my God, I'm implementing that now. <laughs> you know? um, and so the feedback on it was, uh, was fantastic. But um, you know, one of the successes we had with Ben was, this was a, a we did it over a course of, uh, five weeks, um, was his members coming back saying they actually implemented something, which is the whole point, by the way, you know, don't just take all this great information and sit on it and don't do anything with it. Um, and I actually, there's a video on my website, uh, testimonial, um, where this lady, I mean, she went on for like five minutes. Um, she unboxed my shock and awe box. She did an unboxing video. Um, and it's become like this Tuesday. So you open up my shock and awe box and Oh my God, there's, you know, all these different layers and discovery and gifts and things like that. Um, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, ben, ben said, Vance, you had me at hello after he got my, my shock and awe box. So, um, you know, there, there's ways to make impressions and not feel overly salesy and kind of, you know, slimy used car kind of guy. Um, and, you know, the thing I like about Ben too, is he's genuine, you know, what you see is what you get. He's beyond genuine. He's yeah. He is uh, to the point, and he'll tell you what he's thinking. So that's what yeah. I love about him. Um, and then I have a note. Um, also, lessons learned or stories uh, regarding Mike Crow. Oh sure, yeah, Mike's great. He um, he was actually my uh, he was the first one to do a Disney trip with me, um, and so I took uh, like twenty home inspectors that were in his home inspector mastermind, and we did the Disney um, event. Um, so we, I love him because he, he took a chance cause I had never done one. Actually, the, the idea came up in a mastermind. I was with Dan Kennedy and a few other of his, uh, high level mastermind groups. Um, and I got to talking, you know, I'm doing this client experience thing. I used to work for Disney and actually Dustin Burleson, uh, raised his hand and said, I'd pay you to take me around Disney. Great. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and then Mike said, well, yeah, can I, can I take a group? Uh, and I look over at Dan and Dan's like, yes, good idea. Go do it, you know, make it happen. Um, so Mike was the first um, and I still work with Mike. Actually, he was uh, at my mastermind meeting last week uh, in Dallas. Um, and, you know, through this, you know, I've really found that one being genuine, um, you know, because I mean, nobody wants anybody just blowing smoke you know, puffing their chests out and saying, we do this, we do that. And I'm making a million dollars and here's my Lamborghini. Um, you know, it was funny. I was at an event uh, last fall uh, in Orlando 
And I mean, it was, it was like 2000 people there, but it was all internet marketers. Um, you know, a lot of people with supplements and nutrition and things like that. And there were like nine Lamborghinis or some version thereof parked outside. And at midnight one night, all these idiots are out there revving their engines, you know, run on the run. I'm on like the 20th floor. And this sounds like they're right outside. So I went out the next day, talked to the valet. I said, are these, these guys really own these things? He goes, no, all but one is a rental. All right, sure. Cool. I feel better now. <laughs> so, but Mike is real people. Um, you know, he took a chance on me. I, you know, and you, you mentioned Ben's very nice comments about me uh, earlier. Uh, Mike's comments were, were pretty close to the same. So um, yeah, um, great guy to work with. Vance, first of all, I just want to thank you. Thank you for sharing your lessons and uh, the stories and it's anything. All this is, is everything people can put into action today, whether it's an online business or brick and mortar business, it's not matter. I want to p- point people towards deliverservicenow.com. Um, you also, you can go there and um, actually sign up seven, C, you know, easy secrets strategies and get my Disney secrets, a revealed blueprint. You can check that out. He also has a book. Are there any other places we should point people online besides deliverservicenow.com or is that uh, really that's the best place to start? Oh, cool. um, you know, cause you, you, you get my, I, I call it the cliff notes version of my flagship book, which is systematic magic. Um, and once you see that, you're like, oh, yeah, this sounds good. Let me order his book. There's actually um, I will actually send the book for free. You just pay shipping and handling. So no need to go give Amazon any more of your money because uh, it's 20 bucks on Amazon and I'll send it to you free plus, you know, six or seven bucks shipping. So. Love it. I love it. Check it out. And I'm going to be the first one to thank you. Thanks, Vance. All right. My pleasure. It's great being with you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 